Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zupko. Today we're going to speak about terrorism and new dynamics of terrorism. I'm interested in what's going on in 2023 in terrorism, especially when we speak about terrorism studies and research. My guest today is Dr. Tim Wilson. Hello, Tim. Hi, Martin. Many thanks for the invitation to come on this. Dr. Tim Wilson currently serving as the director of the Handa Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews, is a distinguished historian specializing in the diverse impacts of political violence. Dr. Wilson has extensively explored terrorism perpetrated by both governments and their adversaries. His latest publication, Killing Strangers, How Political Violence Became Modern, was published by Oxford Uni University Press in 2020, further solidifying his expertise in this complex field. Also, I would like to mention another book, Contemporary Terrorism Studies, edited by Diego Muro and Tim Wilson, published also by Oxford University Press in 2022, which belongs to one of my favorite textbooks about terrorism. So let's start with a few, let's say, warm up questions. How smarter is terrorism in 2023 compared to 9-11? Thanks, Martin. Um, the trouble with inviting a historian on is they give you complex uh, answers. I suppose my first caveat would be just to say I sort of believe in terrorisms, plural, rather than terrorism. We can generalize to some extent, but uh, it's the historian's obsession to try and contextualize. And I do think, frankly, we're seeing several different trends at once. And that's not that perhaps surprising. The world is a complex place, but I think uh, it's hard to give a simple answer to what is not a unitary phenomenon. I think in terms of sort of operational effectiveness, it's I'm reluctant to sort of say, yes, counter-terrorist uh, agencies are completely on top of the problem. I think we've just seen with the um, Hamas attack on 7th of October that, you know, startling innovation uh, is fully possible. But I do think, as I say, that we sort of need to disaggregate between those groups like perhaps Hamas that are rooted in a particular context, a particular conflict, um, and more transnational uh, actors, and perhaps even um to be slightly more specific about that uh sort of more uh transnational movements the sort of concept of stochastic terrorism that um you know there's movements out there sort of isis have, have played around with this uh in recent years they put out a message and they kind of wait to see who picks it up but it's you know the the actual organizational um sinews between them and the, some operative um some terrorist on the streets of london or whatever um you know is pretty uh, is pretty tenuous. So I, you know, I really don't think we should run away with the idea of a sort of um, kind of terrorist international that has got more and more sophisticated. I guess that I guess we have seen some innovation. I think you know, if one reviews the last twenty years, I think there's been some sort of really quite striking uh, attempts. Uh, particularly around aviation security, there always seems to be a sort of prestige game there. Um, you know, attempts to kind of create cartridge bombs, you know, all that stuff over the early years of the kind of war on terror, shoot bombs, goodness knows what. Um, but I think in one way, I'm actually more struck by the primitive turn. I think in some ways, 9-11 uh, set off a lot of terrorist experts chasing in the wrong direction. You know, they went looking for weapons of mass destruction, and one can understand why governments wanted to fund that kind of research. It was their kind of worst nightmare. Actually, the death tolls of you know 9-11 were, were aberrational, and perhaps the more significant uh, innovation was actually using the aeroplanes as the weapon themselves. And on a you know generally more modest scale, there's been some exceptions. The Nice attack 2016, you know, generated a horrendously high um, toll of fatalities. But generally speaking, this is much kind of smaller scale terrorism. But the primitive turn, the turn to cars, um, the turn to knives, trucks, you know, I think is something we haven't really um, understood very well. I don't. Is it smarter than 9/11? I mean. I don't think we should underestimate it. I think it's often explained as if 
counter-terrorist agencies have now got on top of the problem and making bombs is, you know, complex and easily infiltrated. So uh, a lot of terrorist groups have turned against that. There's probably some truth in that, but I'm actually sort of more struck by how um, the changing role of technology and having streets full of camera phones means that you can do more primitive type attacks and and generate a reaction which you probably couldn't have done 30, 40 years ago. So in that sense, I mean, it's not stupid to do that kind of stuff if attention is what you know you're looking for, as, as is often you know a core part of understandings of what terrorism is. Um, so I'm afraid that's a very muddy and mixed answer to what I think is a very muddy and mixed phenomenon. And do you think that uh, terrorism as a as a concept and all those tools and instruments became more available? I think we're seeing a diffusion um, of the sort of terrorist repertoire. I don't know that this stuff is more available. I mean, in a sense, that's what strikes me as a big um, research gap, frankly. You know, if one looks at the relationship between the automobile and political violence or terrorism or whatever we want to call it, um, you know, it's quite an old one. You know, the first drive-by shooting that I found was a race riot in the USA and uh, 1917. Um, and then, you know, car bombs, actually horse-drawn wagon bombs go back further, but, uh, you know, car bombs become, you know, uh, you know, really quite a feature by the mid-20th century, certainly in Palestine in sort of 47 as a kind of, you know, truck bomb war. Um so this is a long time ago, you know, and we've had a mass automobile own and you know ownership of mass uh, mass ownership of automobiles in the states for uh, at least a hundred years. The idea that you might actually use the kind of kinetic force and velocity of a vehicle as its own weapon has always been on the shelf. It's always been there, um, and yet it doesn't. It, one can find isolated examples, but it hasn't really become a trend until the last. I was going to say fifteen years, but you know, at least really sort of eight years probably um so that seems incredibly recent for a sort of temptation or a possibility that was always there uh and i think we need to sort of think more carefully about those kind of patterns of contagion and imitation than we uh, have already done um just as an aside i mean another example would be suicide bombing you know if one looks at the um assassination of tsar alexander ii in 1881 uh, and there's a couple of other examples from that period of imperial russia um, the idea of the suicide bomber is really not that new. The weird thing is that it's kind of not more used more often <laughs> until the late 20th century. Um, clearly, I think there's something about communications revolutions and mimetic patterns of, of imitation that we need to understand better. I think in that sense, David Rappaport's Four Waves article, important though it is, um, thought-provoking though it is, has actually done us a bit of a disservice. I think a lot of contagion is not 40-year-long rolling waves. It's you know something much shorter and um, immediate than that. I think one of the aspects is also simplicity. Because when I study those uh, terrorist acts in Sahel, for instance, or in Africa, as you said, you know, they they always, you know, follow the same pattern, the simplicity, have some remote control, have some weapons. And and I think it's quite effective as well for terrorists to use them, and also quite cost effective because terrorists needs they they need money to to finance the operation and to survive. So what what's your opinion about financing terrorism nowadays, if we compare it with those channels in the past? And also some students ask me about those stories, you know, that terrorists they sell gold, uranium, oil, you know, for financing the terrorist acts. So what is real and what is myth in that narrative? Okay, thanks, Martin. It's an excellent question. Um, I mean, the coward's answer is go and read my colleague's excellent book, Terrorist Financing by uh, Bill Vlacek. William Vlacek, a colleague in the school, has written an excellent book on this, and he knows far more about it than than I would claim to um, mainly because I'm not very good at money, <laughs> managing money in my own personal life. So the financial trails has never really been what I have followed. Um, also, the drama of terrorism tends to sort of interest me rather than the accountancy behind it. But you're right, the accountancy is important. Of course it is. I mean, I think in terms of um, exploiting, uh, you know, selling gold, uranium, whatever, conflict diamonds, I mean, these are things that militias and armed groups and paramilitary formations of one sort or another in states with weak capacity have been doing for a long time. So, of course, terrorist groups are going to be uh, connected with that. But, I mean, I think... I think, in a sense, that just highlights my earlier point about the importance of context. Very often, whether what we call a group uh, can can shift depending on how threatened we, 
we i'm thinking of the sort of global northwest uh feels by this group but you know actually if you look back to the sources of a lot of this revenue uh is you know often fairly chaotic conditions in which all kinds of militias they might support be supporting a government or opposed to a government or whatever but they're they're just taking their cut they're just taking their rake and you wouldn't expect um terrorist affiliated groups to be doing any any different has it got harder for them i mean i think uh, bill savercheck's wonderful book terrorist financing does you know, show the progress that's been made of the international community of making it harder, but also the challenges, how much of terrorist financing is connected to, unfortunately, charity networks, informal networks of credit transfer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are culturally embedded and often a Western global banking system, you know, struggles to get uh, on top of them. And, you know, just to pay tribute to to that account, I mean, <laughs> It's a very entertaining read, you know, when you can tighten up the legislation, particularly on charity law in the UK was one of the big things that I think has changed in the last 20 years. Um, how much terrorism has it prevented? Hmm, I've no idea. But what I do know is that it's caused a lot of hassle. And you know, the idea that um, you know, Oxford colleges that were founded in the 1350s have to go down to the bank with their original charter of a medieval manuscript from the museum to show their origins so that they can comply with counter-terrorist law shows you some of the complexities and some, just how, how difficult it is to repurpose a global banking system to really be on top of this. Um, I think we've made some progress, but I think as so often with counter-terrorism, it is about turning the flame down rather than off. That seems a more realistic ambition. And when we take it to sort of philosophical level, what's the role of money in terrorism? You know, when, when you research terrorism and those terrorist acts, you know, for instance, I'm always thinking, you know, many of terrorist acts, they are like the value of what they use was like $100 or, or $500, you know, so it's like super low value. And many scholars, they speak about big money. And sometimes when you're researching the terrorism, you Quite of confused, you know. So, what's your opinion about the role of money in terrorism? I'd, I'd go back to what I sort of started by saying: there's terrorisms and terrorisms and different terrorist kind of outfits. I mean, I think you know clearly for the more ambitious actors, um, just Hamas is in my mind because of obvious recent events. Then clearly, um, their scale of ambition and the type of resources that they're trying to accumulate, even if they're not you know, equal to what a state could uh, marshal, but they're significant enough. And to that extent, you know, you're going to need some financing and it is worth, I think, monitoring. Uh, that's a hell of a long way, though, from the sort of general um, kind of call to arms one has got from various extreme right groups, ISIS, whatever, in which, you know, really just some guy with a van goes and most people down. I mean, clearly there you can have as tight counter-terrorist financing laws and policies and monitoring as you like, um, you're probably never going to stop that type of attack. So again, it's about turning a flame down, not off. One of the hot topics when people research terrorism is recruitment. How to get new members to the terrorist organization. Has this changed historically or the pattern remains the same? Well, um, the kind of historical account that I've tried to offer in my work is about really arguing that much of what we call terrorism or terrorist groups are, to some extent, a sort of residual form of violence. They're what rebels do when you really can't do anything else, when you can't you know, stage a popular uh, revolution or rebellion, um, when modern states are comparatively so powerful, you're sort of forced into some fairly subterranean clandestine activity. Um, then the question becomes how you renew that and how you get new recruits. Again, I'd make a distinction between those contexts of long-running conflicts, often with, of an ethno-nationalist um, uh, complexion, Israel, Palestine, Northern Ireland, so on, very different though they are also, uh, where there is a kind of culture which uh, socialises, you know, really quite a large number of people um, into at least um, some rhetorical sympathy with, with some of these terrorist groups or armed groups or whatever we want to call them. Um, so that, you know, is no great mystery there uh, when those conditions um, 
uh, obtain. And I think, you know, what's striking about, say, the United Kingdom's prevent law is that it's not applied to Northern Ireland. You know, why? Because if you applied it in Northern Ireland, you'd have to arrest half of the Fool's Road on a Saturday night for having a few drinks and drinking anti-British rebel, uh, singing anti-British rebel songs. So those contexts are kind of less, um, you know, less baffling. I think, um, in you know, really the kind of radicalization paradigm and the, uh, you know, which is in, in many ways a sort of the other side of the recruitment debate, um, you know, assumes there's something aberrational about individuals joining such movements. Well, there may and there may not be on that, but I do think we have to be careful to factor in um, wider context. Yes, agents and recruiters can be important, but there needs to be a potential constituency out there that is aggrieved enough by whatever it is, um, British foreign policy or, you know, what, whatever it is for, for people to come forward. So... I think from that point of view, actually, the note of caution I would sound is the rise of sort of extreme right terrorism is a kind of phenomenon that we in the terrorism studies community are struggling to get our heads around. I think essentially because we're still the, the trend and the tendency and the temptation is to kind of see this as an aberrational phenomenon. Actually, more worryingly, I would argue something like fascism is an indigenous Western political tradition. Uh, we've had several decades after World War II where it wasn't um, really viable mass politics. You know, it was kind of taboo in, uh, in, in most democracies. Now that era seems to be fading. It's not exactly the same as old style fascism. But, you know, if we want to see why people end up in these groups, we might want to look at what's happening to mainstream politics rather than just trying to uh, look at um, subcultures as if they're unconnected. I think when it comes to the extreme right, they're often more connected than that is comfortable to admit. We always hear some stories about uh, the terrorist was killed or arrested. And then we have another story that uh, the police was keeping an eye on the terrorist or terrorist group. And people ask, how is it possible that after something happens, you know, we have those ones? Like, why the police is not arresting those people? And why we have those stories that, oh, the MI6, MI5, CIA, all those companies, agencies, they knew about them, but did nothing and people are upset about it and also some of my students they are asking that, that this question you know that why the intelligence forces or intelligence gathering is not more effective in that so how would how would you clarify that and maybe there are some implications that are important to mention what is almost impossible to measure with any kind of accuracy even as an order of magnitude not in exact terms but just how big the phenomenon is is the violence that doesn't happen you know that that is part of the problem with this debate is we just don't know how much violence is being uh avoided headed off foiled again talking to the uk context but it'll be comparable other countries i mean mi5 is domestic security services give figures i guess we're meant to take them at face value and you know perhaps we should um but it's very very hard to know and very hard to know you know how developed were those plots that they would say were fo uh, were foiled i think so that's the first thing to say if you actually kind of um look at uh, how many terrorist attacks there are yes there are periods like 2017 you know, now feels a few years ago because we've had COVID between us and it, but you know, it isn't that long ago where there seemed to be a kind of flurry of, um, you know, quite a conveyor belt of uh, kind of horrible incidents and attacks. So, you know, that felt disturbing, but, you know, it's still a rare phenomenon, uh, extremely rare phenomenon. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, I'm, I guess I'm sort of more impressed by you know, how rare a sort of real genuine security screw up like the kind of Manchester bombing uh, is. You know, clearly there have been a lot of, you know, one feels, one senses from the rhetoric of various extreme groups. So there's, there's certainly a lot more kind of wannabes out there who might flirt with this stuff than ever, ever get going. But I think the background factor that I would want to kind of put in there is we also need to think about societal tolerance for 
security measures to prevent this kind of stuff happening, especially preemptive security measures. One of the, you know, just genuine revolutions in my lifetime in the security world has been the uh, implementation, the introduction of prevent style strategies or CVE, countering violent extremism. The idea that, that in a democracy, terrorism is such a horrendous threat that we have to head it off even before it's happened with all of the moral and practical challenges and dilemmas that brings. I grew up with the Northern Irish Troubles going on in the UK. I was 27 years old before a peace deal was done in Northern Ireland. It was all we knew for many, many years. And it's always seemed to me extraordinary from that background where it was just kind of accepted that, you know, some of this terrorism would happen to see the change since 9-11. I think that that was one of the most profound effects of 9-11. The idea was, you know, democracies really just can't stand back and react to this stuff. They really have to get out in front of it. Um, but that is a change in tolerance. That's a change in, in public expectation of what level of risk uh, can be tolerated. So I used to be absolutely baffled as effectively a historian of Northern Ireland who's come into studying terrorism by the sort of statements of the head of MI5 and MI6 a few years back saying, we've never been so stretched. We've never been so busy. And you think, but the groups and capabilities that are out there in the last 10, 20 years is nothing compared to how sophisticated and impressive, uh, I use that term morally neutrally, uh, but the you know provisional IRA were back in the 19. Uh, 90s and the sort of bombs they were putting off in London, 1993, Bishopsgate, um, you know, force of a small tactical nuclear weapon. I mean, just extraordinarily t uh, capable operators. Uh, they weren't trying to kill lots of people, but in terms of they, if they put their minds to it, they could have done extraordinary damage. And it all—I always found that strange. I thought, why is MI5 feeling so stretched compared to you know what seemed to me objectively a rather worse threat uh, a few decades back? I think it is about that revolution in public and political attitudes as to what level of threat is to is tolerable. And the idea that, you know, back in 2017, uh, they had, I think, um, 20,000 closed, what they called SOI, subjects of interest. So individuals who they felt ideal if they had the resources, they would be keeping an eye on, but couldn't, because uh, they didn't have the resources. And that just seems, you know, I mean, that, that I think is, is where the explanation lies. That is just so much larger than the sort of suspect communities that have been keeping an eye on um, I guess of you know the Irish immigrant communities in Britain back in the day. So, so I think there is a revolution of of expectation there. I mean, the sort of the the provocative long term comparison I give in Killing Strangers is the uh, Sydney uh, Street siege of 1911. A couple of Latvian anarchists end up uh, holed up in the East End of London. Uh, Winston Churchill is Home Secretary. Of course, he loves a photo opportunity, so he goes down and enjoys all of the publicity. Uh, and basically, you know, the actual they end up calling in the army. But before they call in the army, the rules of engagement are such that some poor London copper, some poor London policeman, has to go knock on the door and get himself shot and wounded before they have legal permission to actually kind of shoot it out with this couple of guys. You compare that to, say, the threat of suicide bombers in recent years on the tube and, you know, the tragedy of de Menendez, the Brazilian carpenter uh, or electrician, was it, who was shot dead. I mean, it's just a complete revolution in what the what, what politicians gauge the public will tolerate. So... Um, to answer your question in a roundabout way, uh, I think it's very hard to know exactly how much the security forces are um, preventing. Uh, my hunch is it's probably quite a lot. Um, but two, you know, I guess I would ask your students respectfully and um, uh, not, I hope, too rudely, but, you know, what, what level of police state do you want to live in? You know, because that is the dilemma. That's, that's, that's a very important implication of that and privacy law and all those things. But also media, newspapers, what we see on TV, all that environment is influencing how we perceive terrorism. Do you think that we use terrorism as a word too much? Uh, I guess I'm professionally obliged to say yes. I mean, killing strangers is a kind of history of terrorism that dare not speak the name. You know, um, it is a kind of history of terrorism, but it very carefully doesn't allow itself to be pinned down. It says essentially, look, there's a type of violence that many scholars have understood to be distinctive by its 
indirect structuring, you know, group A attacks group B to send a message to C, you know, usually a government. Uh, that's what's distinctive about this type of violence. And it's a kind of, to use the language of a sociologist Max Weber, it's an ideal type as a kind of cleaned up model or template. That seems to me useful, but I was more interested in the kind of role of context in molding these um, phenomena rather than getting into a very muddy discussion of what is terrorism and what isn't. I am I have some sympathy to those who are trying to salvage the term for analysis, people like Staffis Calavas, who would just tend to say, well, it's the political violence that groups do when they can't hold territory. And that's kind of, you know, fairly morally neutral kind of claim, really. Um, I have some sympathy for that. The actual reality, and I may just be too old and too tired and too cynical here is that you're using a term that is also in public circulation you know not everyone in coffee shops and on the high street or on tv or whatever is using it with the kind of precision we would hope scholars would so if you're going to use it you're going to have to say clearly what you mean by it and you're going to have to accept you're not going to persuade everyone um part of me is just would rather bypass that and just say okay also I think it's the historian in me, Martin. I'm, I'm kind of used to, th you know, historians are kind of interested in context and contingency and change. They're less interested in the sort of conceptual purity that some social scientists are. Um, I think it's very hard to track a stable meaning of terrorism over time. It, it really does shift an awful lot. So, yes, as a short answer, we should probably be a little more careful. Let's jump to the research of terrorism. And the first easy question for you, methodologies and how to research terrorism effectively. And I, I know that we can't go through each method or each approach, but let's let's build on your experience as the director of the Honda Center. What was or what is the most effective method at the moment? Maybe some of your recommendations or maybe you have some bright students that uh, even came with some innovation in researching terrorism. Well, I'm just coming off the back of teaching a research methods module. So uh, that's a good you... preparation for this interview. <laughs> well, it's kind of a boot camp that we put our students to, uh, through rather. And it, I always think of it as a bit of a kind of all you can eat buffet. You know, you go through an all you can eat buffet, don't try and eat everything. You, know, you, you just can't. Um, and, you know, I think that another point I sort of tend to make is that methodologies, cut, they're a bit like kind of, a bit like when you go for a walk in the forest and you see some oak tree that's come down and, you know, the, the roots tend to bring a huge kind of plate of earth with them. That sort of root plate, um, you know, also also is the case with with methodologies and social sciences and studying terrorism. You know, there's always a kind of philosophical root plate. There's always kind of set of assumptions about how we should investigate the world that comes with it. So um, you want to get kind of a sensitivity to that before you start trying to mix and match different methodologies. Having said that, I do think that a genuinely interdisciplinary approach to studying terrorism is always going to be preferable to, uh, you know, just kind of um, sort of arid uh, particularisms of the you know, little groups just doing their thing. And that the one of the things that's kind of struck me as a scholar who's come in from history into terrorism studies is 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 this real push by certain parts of the academy to kind of shore up terrorism studies as a kind of fairly clearly delineated and robust um, deduct, uh, so, yeah, deductive um, type uh, branch of the social uh, of the social sciences. So, you know, often kind of quite rigorous in terms of stating research questions, hypotheses up front, then testing them. Now, obviously, there's some good work you can do with that. Um, I guess I'm always going to be inductive. In, in other words, I tend to kind of look at a problem and not know what I make of it and then kind of try and tease out some sort of theory or pattern or explanation from the kind of mess of evidence I've stumbled across. That's kind of how historians tend to work. I think we need both, but we need dialogue. And it's hard to, it's hard to get that productively 
synchronized, even in a good center like my own. I think we've made some progress. I think there's other excellent hubs. I don't, you know, don't want to, you know, um, don't want to run anyone down or overlook anyone. But you know, um, IGSA in Leiden or C-Rex, they're they're also quite interdisciplinary. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to understand how even neighboring branches of the social science works and what their assumptions are, and to listen with respect rather than just to fall back into one's graduate school training of no, oh, that's not how I was taught how to do it. Um, so I I think you know it, it, it's a work in progress, and we're still kind of we're still struggling with that. I hope 20 years after 9-11, as the field begins to settle down, that actually we have made some advances. We are in a better place. I think some of the kind of um, American political science, number crunching, quantitative approaches have become a lot more sophisticated. I think um, it's encouraging to see a field, field that's really beginning to ask hard questions. Why does more terrorism not happen? Um, even though, you know, I as a historian tend to go, well, you know, you're probably overlooking context a bit, you know, you can test a load of variables, but you might want to dialogue with people you know about those specific contexts as well. I mean, I guess I'm sort of professionally bound to say we need more history and probably um, related subjects like anthropology. I'm sort of interested in human behavior within bounded situations with a sort of what's sometimes called in anthropology, a thick description. In other words, a kind of deep enough understanding of how participants see their actions um, that one can begin to make sense of them. So one needs a kind of, again, it's Weber's Verstehen, uh, as he would call it in German, you know, but uh, one needs to research empathy and understanding of how these actors see the world. That is not the same as a research sympathy. Um, and, and that, I think, is is quite a challenge that we are still wrestling with. I think uh, back in the day, you had a few remarkable academics, um, uh, Jose Bezalika, who sort of, you know, does his kind of anthropology of the Basque conflict and tries to join Etta at one point, Bowyer Bell, who hangs around the provisional IRA. You had some of that stuff in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when I think, I think, uh, you know, research cultures were a lot more relaxed and slash reckless, depending on how you see it. Um, and then, you know, for a lot of the kind of academic study of terrorism, it's just the, the legal hurdles and risks have just been too high for that. We're now in a strange hybrid kind of period where a lot of ethnography and sort of quasi-anthropology is possible just because of the proliferation of online cultures, but they're often kind of adjacent to real terrorism. We're sort of studying extremists who might flirt with terrorism rather than the terrorists themselves. Um, and in some ways, that's, you know, the, the, just being able to kind of actually look at, at these kind of interactions online, um, you know, is enormously rewarding. And that, that seems to be one of the real kind of growth frontiers of terrorism studies. But is it exactly terrorism studies still, or, or is it something that's kind of adjacent? It's certainly rich. It's certainly illuminating. Um, but uh, quite what the actual relationship to actual violence is, I think, is is more opaque, if I can put it that way. So, um, yeah, I, I th those would be the the, the kind of uh, areas I'd like to see more development of in the contemporary terrorism studies textbook that you um, were kind enough to mention in the introduction. Uh, I do talk a little bit about this in an introductory chapter um, that it struck me as a terrorism study is a bit like a kind of sandwich, you know, at the sort of main level of abstraction, political science, international relations. We have a lot of good work at the kind of bottom level, the kind of other bit of bread, if you like, the individual level. Psychology, criminology tends to kind of look at individual radicalization or whatever. Um, it was a kind of mid level that seemed to be a bit of a thin sandwich filling. I think of that as kind of history, anthropology, ethnography, whatever. Uh, I think we've made some progress, but uh, we could still do with more there, I think. Tim, in uh, international relations, um, there is sort of a new field or a new avenue for publications dealing with the non-Western approaches. And we see how many scholars and researchers, they're trying to discover new approaches from being located not in the Western Hemisphere, but for instance, in the countries of so-called Global South, in Asia, in Africa. Do we have sort of terrorism studies approach coming from this avenue? Or terrorism as a study field is more global? So when you speak with your colleagues in Asia, in Africa, in different countries, you basically follow a very similar pattern of research. It's an excellent question. I mean, I think um, I think we need more. 
uh, you know, definitely need more, uh, if, if only because, you know, you look at any even fairly crude surveys uh, of general trends, um, you know, most of the political violence we call terrorism isn't happening in the global north and the Anglophone, either Anglophone countries or countries with a you know, high proportion of educated English speakers. Um, but that's the genesis of terrorism studies. You know, it's a kind of Anglophone discipline largely, and it's come out of North America largely. Um, and, you know, there have been times in the past, Western Europe in the 80s, when it seemed often the type of violence they were studying, that that was the hotspot. Those areas aren't the hotspot really anymore. It's sub-Saharan Africa and um, uh, Sahel and, and, and um, perhaps now Middle East again, um, that are more uh you know to the fore for obvious reasons um the issue i think is not is not do we need this research and are there are there different approaches I, i'm sure you know i'm sure there are my excellent colleague um amenia kali who works on nigeria and the kind of terrorist kind of efforts against uh, boko haram has kind of taught me a, a, a lot there um the the question is often just practical that the resources uh, are so weighted to you know the sort of uh, more established hubs such as St Andrews um, that it it's actually really quite hard to sort of build out and that's maybe a poor excuse and is never a, an excuse for not trying harder but you know, there's kind of really quite big practical logistical problems with um, developing that sort of capacity but it is encouraging to see at least in some of the sort of handbooks, um, my colleague Sarah Marsden has got one out on radicalization, but or the Cambridge History of Terrorism that our ex director Richard English uh, published a few years back. There's definitely uh, quite rightly a sort of attempt to say, okay, right, you know, if, if this subject has, uh, subject area has global pretensions, then we need to kind of try and do it globally. There's still a long way to go, though. We also see many private companies um, portraying themselves as a terrorist research uh, providers or support research providers, they often argue with the OSINT, Open uh, Intelligent Research. And uh, my question is, what is the collaboration between academia, for instance, the center, Honda Center at St. Andrews, with private companies on researching terrorism? Thanks, Martin. I mean, it's a, it is a field that we're trying to develop. I mean, my own feeling as director is that one should have a kind of pluralism of scholarship, the sort of type of scholarship that I'm most comfortable with and that I would try and produce, which is kind of historical, long-term, suggestive, um, isn't always what policymakers in a hurry want. Um, so we are trying to um, really develop a kind of consultancy and professional development arm. If I'm absolutely honest with you, it's been more the public sector, although in the United Kingdom, the public sector is so privatized that, you know, these boundaries can get kind of blurry, but it's, you know, um, it, it's often agencies of the state or prisons or whatever that, that we come to us for kind of that sort of training. And that is, say, an important part of what we do and are hoping to develop. Having said that, um, you know, one of the kind of striking features since the Manchester tragedy in 2017 is a really determined attempt by the British government to put more responsibility on uh, the private sector, particularly in the area of hospitality, entertainment, concerts, big pubs, those sort of things, uh, concert halls, um, to uh, take their security more seriously, obviously on the back of the uh, Manchester horror. So you know, the tradition in Britain has tended to be that security has been seen very much as the state's job, actually, is one of the few areas that haven't been outsourced and privatised. Uh, and there is now an attempt, I think, uh, through the so-called um, Martin's Law, named after one of the victims of that awful atrocity, uh, to um, sort of roll that out, that the private sector becomes uh, more engaged in providing their own security. So I think there are opportunities developing there. Um, I'm, you know, as ever, don't want to sound too kind of old fashioned and ivory tower like, but uh, it does have to be a two way story. Street, you know, who pays the piper calls the tune in the old English saying. Um, and, you know, what private companies pay for and are looking for and what we're able to deliver in terms of well thought out, uh, insightful scholarship is it, it can be a negotiation that is is kind of more complex than one might think. Um 
it, there does need to be a bit of a kind of give and take, I think, on both sides. And, and, and a sort of learning process, our, our learning, okay, what does the private sector actually need from us? We do do a certain amount of training on our certificate on kind of personal security, but also what they they're learning what we can give them that they didn't necessarily know they they needed you know if that makes sense so it's it's a learning curve let's let's uh, uncover a little bit the honda center when people go online to wikipedia and all those websites they they reading you know that honda center is a center for study terrorism political violence is research center and all those things but realistically if we can use this opportunity and that we have you here what people can find in the Honda Center or in, in a university that is researching terrorism? Because some junior researchers, some students, they have some expectations, they they you know they have some dreams, they have some goals, you know. And and many times um, there is a big influence of all those movies about secret service, then you have the movies about terrorism and all of that. Thanks, Martin, for that invitation. I mean, I guess our starting off point is we are the oldest such center in europe you know we were founded in august 1994 which um you know makes us really very venerable very uh very ancient relatively speaking for um designated studies for the the, the uh or hubs for the, for the study of terrorism and political violence i think the fact that we're in St Andrews, not London, is in some ways an asset. Um, you know, we have excellent partners in London uh, who are much closer to the policy world. You know, we're not. We tend to kind of perhaps publish um, a little less uh, when we say something hopefully is deeply researched, well thought out and stands the test of time. You know, if we produce um, alongside the policy engagement and the consultancy I was just talking about, you know, if we produce major books that uh, people still read in 10, 15, 20 years time, I will be happy uh, as director. Um, and I think, you know, um, looking at what some of my colleagues are producing at the moment, I think um, we do. I think, you know, we are a sort of leading centre for um, study of radicalization and, and desistance. My colleague, Sarah Marsden, um, Peter Lair is a kind of leading expert on maritime terrorism and militant Buddhism of all subjects. He's very uh, broad in his ranges of uh, expertise. Uh, Amenia Kali, I mentioned on Boko Haram and, and so on. There's a whole range of us doing different um, types of uh, research, but I think it's all deeply contextualized um, and isn't fashion chasing you know we, of course we comment on um on recent and contemporary crises but uh we're not as reactive as some places in just following whatever happens to be top of the agenda this week so if you were to come to the um to hand a CSTBV as, as you know we we tend to call it CSTV is the the older name before Japanese billionaire um Dr. Harushi Handa gave us a, a generous bequest of, of a few uh, years back. Um, but CSTV is the old sort of name. It's a bit ugly, but it's a, it is memorable. It's well known in the field. If you were to come to CSTBV, then uh, you, I think, have a fairly unique research culture of, you know, eight full-time academics, a couple of research fellows who um, are more than the sum of our, their parts. You know, we uh, I think we do work closely together in an interdisciplinary way that um, is particularly interested, as I say, in, in foregrounding context, history, um, and, and asking unusual questions. You know, that I that I think is really the sort of intellectual ambition is, you know, if you come to us, hopefully, um, one doesn't tend to hear the same types of things, um, you know, as one might hear elsewhere. We sort of really prize uh, originality. Um, I think one also has access to resources, you know, and a sort of being aware that one is part of a tradition that goes back now nearly 30 years. And the books that have been produced from the centre and the number of um, PhDs that you can, uh, theses that you can find in St Andrew's Library, there is a sort of enormous body of work. And indeed, I mean, you look at the shelves behind me, there's, you know, <laughs> our offices are bulging full of kind of, you know, basically 50 years worth of sort of, uh, you know, library on kind of terrorism books as, as well as what's in the St Andrew's Library. So there's a real kind of sense that you've got a kind of abundance of resources. One of the things that I'm most proud of recently was securing a um, the future of an enormous 
archive of newspaper clippings. Uh, it doesn't, may not sound very much, but I'm talking about, you know, 1600 bulging ring binder files for the newspaper clippings about terrorist incidents all around the world from about 1979 to 1994. Um, that you can, you know, is, is particularly useful for the sort of backstory of uh, certain ongoing long running uh, conflicts today and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of abundance of resources materially, an abundance of expertise. Also, I think an abundance of um, networking contacts. You know, we are quite well networked through particularly our certificate program, which appeals to practitioners, people working in army, police, security, often, but uh, journalism too, other, other fields. Um, that you know sometimes come back to us with internships, so we can sometimes put our master students the way of of those kind of opportunities. Um, and you know, hopefully, you will also be exposed to a sort of learning culture that is old fashioned in a good way. You know, we try to sort of keep an open door policy. We try to be generous with our time. Um, that you know we are genuinely interested in our students' individual. Uh, learning journey and try and support it. Um, you know, it's not a sort of question of, well, you've got two hours off, you know, two office hours a week and you can come see me and when 20 minutes, is, you know, you've got to go. It's not like that. We try to make time for our students. Um, and through a program of public events, um, you know, try to sort of essentially uh, give access to some of the kind of leading names in the field, um, if you look at our honorary professors, people like Jonathan Evans, ex-head of MI5, and so on and so forth, um, that it's quite a roster of uh, both academic and, and um, practitioner talent. And if you look at, say, um, online on YouTube for, say, our 25th um, anniversary, which we held a couple of major conferences, you'll get some sense of how well networked the centre is within the world of studying terrorism, um, sometimes rather affectionately known as uh, the mothership, just because, you know, we, co we have trained a lot of people who are now at other places. And, uh, you know, that responsibility as director is something I never forget. One, one stands in a, in a long tradition. And, you know, I never forget that, you know, Bruce Hoffman and Paul Wilkinson, who set us up in 1994, um, was swimming against the tide. You know, terrorism wasn't a fashionable subject in 1994. It was seen as yesterday's news. They took longer views. I think they've been proven right. What is a good dissertation for Handa Center? Like, I know it's it's a bit of generalization because each professor is different and there are different cr criteria on, on, you know, students. But still, you know, as, as people interested in PhD or pursuing research uh, in St. Andrews, what dissertation is about for you? What's his, what's what's the impression of it might be? You know, when it's really good one and short answer is look at our website. We have an occasional paper series, which uh, is basically something I started um, as director, which is essentially taking some of our best dissertations and just putting a new cover sheet on them and saying, look, this deserves to be published, and even if it doesn't find its way into an academic journal for whatever reason, we still think it should be on the website. So. Uh, if one looks under occasional um, papers on the CSTV website, you'll see some examples of what we have thought were good dissertations. So at the master's level, a dissertation is um, you know, a major piece of original work conducted over an academic year um, that comes to approximately 15,000 words. It's quite a substantial piece of work. It's often the piece of work the students find most fulfilling to undertake, um, but it's not a PhD and it's uh, conducted with limited resources. So we do not expect miracles, but uh, I think really the leitmotif of what makes for quality is originality. If you know one reads a dissertation and thinks, I learned something there that I hadn't thought of, uh, even if it's a familiar subject presented from an unfamiliar angle, um, then that really is kind of what, what we're hunting. You know, good research tells us something that we didn't know before. Um, and uh, off the top of my head, thinking of dissertations I have marked over the last 13 years or whatever, um, they can be extraordinarily varied. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, work on on areas that have you know, really been uh, fashionable of late on uh, gender and terrorism, discourses of terrorism, sort of incel movement. But sometimes, um, sometimes they're actually sort of quite modest contributions. But we had a student a few years back who went back and uh, interviewed uh, a load of people have been involved in the now largely forgotten campaign for um, to detach South Tyrol from Italy and join it to to Austria. So you know, the nineteen sixties, a 
you know, a bunch of guys were running around blowing up railway lines and pylons, and this student managed to catch some of the elderly members of these groups and get some, um, you know, get some interview material that was that was fascinating. And I think they were careful not to give away anything too secret, and it wasn't as nearly as kind of deliberately wasn't the kind of bloodthirsty terrorism we see more of. But that that sort of contribution was was very useful. Um, I'm thinking of a student again. This is on the website in the occasional papers, but I'm thinking of a student who went back into the archives, the National Archives down in London, and looked at um, what he could find about um, British interrogation and, frankly, torture techniques in Palestine in the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, even in that very difficult subject area, reading official documents between the lines to see what they were trying to cover up, he made a pretty powerful case for, you know, practices like waterboarding being, you know, pretty... uh, pretty uh, standard back then. So, you know, that, of course, that's a couple of historical examples because I'm a historian, but, um, you know, it's, it's really a very broad range. But it, but in the, all of those cases, uh, it's about reading a dissertation and thinking, right, okay, yeah, now I haven't seen that before. That It may hopefully uh, show it knows the, the relevant literature it's building on, know the gap it's trying to fill, but does say something original uh, that um, you know we hadn't thought of before. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean it's it's necessarily right, or or that more couldn't be done. But I think just as I say, just shaking up one's expectations and and forcing the reader to think um, on the basis of a well constructed evidence uh, argument backed up with evidence. Based on your experience, I'm I'm I also interested in one slightly. Um, less common topic of discussion, and that's misunderstandings of studying terrorism. So do you have any cases, or maybe you had some students that they wanted to study terrorism, but there was some sort of misunderstanding what does it act, what does actually mean to study terrorism? So maybe we can clarify on that a little bit, if you have any cases from the past. I think uh, that it is an encouraging sign of the, the maturation of the field, not just amongst the established academics, but also amongst those who um, may come in to study it at master's level and then go off or, or in some other direction, that um, in the years I've been at St Andrews, uh, one has tended to have serious students with serious expectations. One has heard, I have heard, um, you know, some sort of entertaining stories from uh, the period before, I think, when there was that extraordinary explosion of kind of interest in terrorism after 9-11, in which all kinds of people suddenly chased after a subject they hadn't really thought about, and, you know, certain assumptions, um, you know, had to be challenged. Um, sometimes a kind of, you know, Western-centric, US-centric kind of um, uh narrowness of assumption around what terrorism was or what it looked like or and so on and so forth so i think you know i I could certainly think of examples from back then i think one of the incidents or or angles we've had to think i'm not sure it's a misunderstanding but it's certainly a blind spot is how we appropriately should study something that by its nature involves horrific and deliberate human cruelty. Um, In the past, we have occasionally run um, field trips to Northern Ireland, it's nearby and, you know, has significant experience of political violence, of course, so it's been an obvious kind of um, neighbouring region to visit. And the the Wave Centre there, which, you know, is an extraordinary, um, impressive trauma management centre, some of our students have really been hit very hard by talking to survivors who come and talk to them. I mean, inevitably, this is a sensitive area, but these are people who are willing to talk. Um, And just occasionally, students have been really sort of just completely knocked sideways by the horror and the trauma of what they're hearing, and that what had seemed abstract in the kind of St Andrew's Library suddenly doesn't seem abstract when there's someone in front of you uh, detailing things that no human being should have to see. Um, I don't quite know what the answer to that is, you know, whether one, whether we should do more trigger warnings or, or um, you know, what we can sort of reasonably expect in terms of um, sort of mental preparation. But I, I think, I do think it is worth if you are interested in studying terrorism, just 
taking some advice from those who've done it for a while as to sort of how you pace yourself if you're and you know, even if you're not looking exactly at terrorism if you're looking at kind of rather kind of hate-filled extremist cultures online if that's what your research is that you you just kind of know when you've had enough and that you walk away from it and you take a break and you remember this is not usual human behavior and so on and so forth so i don't know if it's a misunderstanding but i think there can be a naivety there and I don't accuse the students of that because I think it's a naivety that I would have as well I kind of go back and forth between trying to study something with a sort of level of academic detachment because I think that's helpful analytically and genuinely asking myself whether I'm distorting and sanitizing the actual nature of what I'm studying because I'm not really focusing on the emotional trauma constantly um but I think it's hard to do good analysis if you do The last question for today's interview. We are recording this interview in December 2023 during the Hamas and Israel conflict. And um, there are two questions, actually. The first one, what's the role of terrorism in the Israel-Hamas conflict after those uh, atrocities that we saw in October? And uh, the second question, what implications can we maybe formulae may be fine on or related to research terrorism like uh, do you think that this conflict this uh, escalation and all what's going on in gaza will change terrorism okay thanks martin uh, yeah a, a hot topic obviously at, at the time um i mean i think that when we decide to study terrorism there's often a sort of dilemma as to whether we should see it as a subject and a kind of force in its own right or as a symptom of deeper conflicts um again i'm betraying my background here which is sort of unusual in terrorism studies but you know historians have tended to see terrorism as kind of a symptom of of other conflicts that are going on um rather than as a kind of intrinsically fascinating subject in its own right uh i think it's sometimes one sometimes the other i'm sorry if that's wishy-washy and goes back to my second there's different types of terrorism but you know there are clearly moments when violence that i think we can plausibly describe as terroristic or terrorism or whatever um seems to change things i mean June 1914, the assassination in Sarajevo, the sparks of World War One is one. Uh, 9-11, of course, is another. And, you know, it's pretty clear that the Hamas attack, um, 7th of October, has already upended the Middle East. Um, you know, the uh, Netanyahu's government uh, policy of sort of containment, of essentially just bottling up Hamas and ignoring them, is, you know, clearly over. <laughs> if, if nothing else, we can say that with confidence. So... Um, There is a sort of constant yin yang pull, I think, analytically in different ways as to you know whether we should be sort of contextualizing terrorism, seeing it as symptomatic, or whether we should be seeing it as a kind of motive for destabilizing force in its own right. And it can be, I think, um, a bit of both. Uh the the semantics of what we call what uh, you know different actors is inevitably polarized and polarizing. Um, you know, I have no problem at all in describing the Hamas attacks as kind of um terrorism if we if we want to kind of use that term as a you know demonstrative atrocity to kind of polarize and send a wider message um but of course uh you know the the, the sort of spiraling death toll we're we're now seeing from the kind of Israeli responses you know raising questions of um whether that is also not a sort of type of type of signaling so I kind of tend to I, I think as I say I'm less interested perhaps in the sort of, you know, what what we call terrorism here and more in the effects. I think this is kind of, uh, you know, essentially a kind of um, like one of those ink block tests that, you know, psychologists um, developed 100 years ago. You know, one one set of uh, sympathizers just sees a kind of um, tyrant state in its rage, you know, bludgeoning Gaza. The other side sees ancestral nightmares of, you know, anti-Jewish pogroms, you know, come back to life again. So it's, it, it, there's there's a hell of a lot of um, a dispute there, of course, on, on, on the perceptions. In terms of what effect this is going to have on studying terrorism, um, too early to say, of course. I think I've been in the short term 
I think it's being sort of seen as another round of a long entrenched Israel Palestine conflict that's been going on at least 75 years, if not 100 years and more. Um, and actually, it hasn't. Uh, I mean, I'm just crudely talking about the sort of media interest for my center. It hasn't actually quite led to the upsurge of interest. I thought there, there, there might be. Um, so I think it's a bit early to say, but I do think it, at the least, it probably has been a wake up call to the slightly simplistic turning away from terrorism as a subject that we saw happening during COVID, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Ukraine war, climate crisis, all of which, you know, plausibly suggested that maybe terrorism, as we'd understood it before, and the war on terror wasn't the world's worst problem. Um, and, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that point of view. But I think the idea that, well, therefore, it was never going to, it was just going to stop being a problem, and we could stop worrying about it, I think was, was uh, simplistic. And I think this, you know, I think the recent um, Hamas atrocity will uh, put uh, put it back on the map. Quite how that works out, you know, I I uh, I don't know. I would hope actually it gave a boost to kind of counterterrorism studies. Um, whatever one one sympathies, I think uh, you know, if I were to sort of reach one conclusion, it's like whatever Israel is trying to do, I just don't see how it's going to make Israel safer in the long run. Um, I, I'm just, yeah, I mean, even if, if one tries to just see the situation through the prism of, uh, security prism of Israel's own interests, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all convinced that they're, um, they're on the road to any kind of long-term victory. And I, you know, say that with, um, just deep regret for the human cost on both sides. Tim, thank you very much for your time, insightful thoughts and remarks. And information that you share with us. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And um, I think it's a very important discussion because uh, terrorism is with us and it it shows many faces. And more, more we research terrorism and more we share information, we might uh, get some new inputs, maybe some new research projects and ideas. And uh, this will help us to better understand not only terrorism, but also the dynamics of terrorism which are super important when we want to inform public about the threats, about the terrorism and the future implications of it. Tim, again, thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Not at all. My pleasure. See you next time. <laughs>